Hi, I'm Simon Reynolds, and I'd like to welcome you to the Fortune Institute, an extraordinary business course that can transform your business life. The Fortune Institute is vastly different from your typical business school. Number one, it's practical. We're not gonna fill your head with a whole lot of academic theory that you're never gonna use. We are real entrepreneurs telling you how it really works. I've spent over 25 years in business, and over 20 years of that is actually owning and running businesses of my own. I know what works, I know what mistakes to avoid, and I'm gonna teach you the good stuff. Second of all, the Fortune Institute course is incredibly time efficient. You don't have to spend tens of hours a week studying. Really, it's all about one short, sharp lesson each week and a little bit of homework that you use through your business to make it grow exponentially. And finally, we're different from your typical business school because we're cost effective. You know, some of the best business schools in the world charge anywhere from $10,000 to $50,000 to even $80,000 a year for their courses. But you can study some of the very best concepts in business with us. In fact, many of them not taught at those business schools for a fraction of that cost. You know, I regularly give one hour speeches for $10,000 to business audiences, but I will teach you the same stuff I teach them here for just a fraction of the price. Now, having said that, yes, it's practical. Yes, it's time efficient. Yes, it's cost effective. But we need something from you to make your time at the Fortune Institute work, and that is dedication. We're only gonna ask for an hour a week of your time, but you must commit mentally to making sure you watch these lessons every week. Set a time in your diary to make it happen and make sure you get it done. If you do the work, you will get the results. What kind of results? Well, all kinds of rewards. Number one, of course, is money. I mean, I would have done a terrible job if I can't dramatically increase the amount of money that you will make in your business. I know how to do it. I've consulted for over 20 years with clients teaching them how to do it, and I will make it happen if you do the homework. So not only will you make a lot of money doing this course, you will also have the satisfaction, which I think is more important, of achievement. Business isn't just about money. The real thing that will satisfy you is building an extraordinary organization, maybe one, two, five, ten offices, maybe several countries. All these things are possible if you really study with the Fortune Institute. And finally, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're not a conservative organization. We're not some hundred-year-old academic institution. We're light, we're breezy, we're just like you. And we're going to make sure that the content and the lessons are upbeat and fun. So let's begin. I want to talk about how great entrepreneurs think. Now, there are a million different types of entrepreneurs in a million different industries of a million different ages, but the reality is they all share seven characteristics. And today I want to take you through some of those. I think it's so important to get the mental part right. And if you can develop these character traits of the great entrepreneurs, then you will vastly increase your chances. The first is, Great entrepreneurs are contrarian. They do not think typically. They aren't afraid to go and try different stuff, do different things, and get the flack from people for doing it. You know, Albert Einstein said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. It's tough to be a contrarian. People give you flack, but you've got to develop that characteristic. So how do you become a contrarian? Well, I think there's two aspects of contrarianism. The first is, it's an attitude. It's the mental part. So what do I mean by that? What I suggest is that you actually start seeing yourself as a contrarian. You get up in the morning and you go into your business and you say, how can I think differently? How can I be contrary to what my competition's doing? Now, at first, that will seem a little strange, but if you do it, and do it regularly and do it every day, what you're gonna find is it's going to become a habit and you're going to become 
naturally a contrarian. The more you work on your self-image, the more you will become like that person. The mind is just a computer. Focus on being a contrarian and you'll get it. Attitude is vital. But it's not just a contrarian attitude that I'm talking about. It's also a contrarian strategy. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, it's the actual strategies that you're using day to day to form your business must be contrarian in nature. Well, let me give you a few examples. There's a stack of ways to be contrarian through the strategy. Let me deal with just three of them. The first is, look at opening new markets. Yes, you're in your particular industry, but how can you move into a new market in that industry? It's not easy, but it can be done. And every year we see extraordinary examples of companies pulling it off. Have a look at Red Bull. 15 years ago, there were no energy drinks. Up comes Red Bull, it's almost a single product company, and now it's a dominant force in soft drinks around the world by simply going into an area that no one was thinking about. Or have a look at BlackBerry, RIM, a Research in Motion, the company behind BlackBerry, were the first to come out with a mainstream phone that also had email usage. They're still a dominant player in the smartphone market. eBay had the guts to be contrarian and open an auction system that was online. They're now one of the largest companies in the world. There's a company called lulu.com. You may not have heard of it, but an extraordinary example of contrarian thinking. Everyone wants to write a book and almost no one can get published. But if you go to lulu.com, they'll publish each and every book that you send them. It doesn't matter what you write. And people can order them right around the world. It's a powerful, original, contrarian idea, and it's making them seven-figure profits. Or look at Ford. I mean, decades and decades and decades ago, there was a man named Henry Ford who said, forget this horse and buggy thing. Everybody is going to drive around in their own vehicle. Now, that was ridiculous. They didn't even have paved roads back then. But here was a man's long-term time perspective, and he built an extraordinary company. So finding a new market is one way to be contrarian strategically. But if you can't do that, then just change the rules for the market you're in. That's a far easier strategy, but it can be super effective as well. Let's talk about a few examples of that. Look at Starbucks. Here's a company that has dominated the coffee business. But really, what did they do? Well, go back 15 years, and this company really transformed the way people saw coffee. Back in those days, coffee was something that was given uh, as uh, an, almost an afterthought in diners and in cafes around the place. Uh, plenty of times, they'd refill your cup for free. And in came Starbucks, and they said, no, no, no. Coffee's better than this. We're going to focus on coffee. We're going to bring the European styles of coffee around to America and then the rest of the world. And we're going to charge a fortune, comparatively, for each cup of coffee. Did it go well? Well, Starbucks have now got 16,000 stores. It's the power of a contrarian attitude. Look at Zara, an absolute phenomenon in international fashion. Now, every few weeks in your typical store, they'll change the clothes that are in it. Zara adds new stuff in their stores twice a week. Twice a week. So you can go in any time to a Zara store and there's stuff that's new. It transformed the timelines for fashion and it transformed Zara into just a few stores to one of the biggest retail empires in the world. Hummer. Not everybody might like the Hummer car, but look at how they went into a new area and transformed the SUV, the four-wheel drive market. In, prior to Hummer, there were cars, there were SUVs that were a bit bigger, but they instituted this mean mother of a four-wheel drive, an SUV that was just completely out of the ordinary, and they built a business from it. That's the power, once again, of contrarian thinking. Are you being a contrarian in your business? Now, contrarianism can also affect pricing as well. There's a lot of opportunities to think different in pricing. Take the software industry. Some software companies lease their software to, to corporations, and so they charge money for their service every single year. Or you have examples like haste and bed. You might pay $800 for a typical bed, maybe $1,000 for a typical bed. You buy a haste and bed, the average one sells for $15,000, and they've got beds for $57,000. Now, is that a waste of money? Well, I don't think so. Haste and Beds are loved by their clients and it's an extremely successful operation. So 
look at your pricing. You might find there's a chance to be contrarian there. Another example of contrarianism in prices is Transcendental Meditation, the world's largest company for teaching meditation. Now I remember when I learned meditation through them, I was stunned to find out their price is not a set price. It's literally just give us a week's wages. If you don't earn much, no problem. Just give us a week's worth of what you earn. And if you earn a lot, we still want a week's wages. Radical, novel, but incredibly effective. The power of being a contrarian. So ask yourself, are you being contrarian enough in your business? It's one of the number one characteristics of how great entrepreneurs think. The second characteristic of how great entrepreneurs think is long-term time perspective. The problem with a lot of media about business these days is people glorify these companies that are suddenly worth 300, 400 million dollars in a year or two. And we see these dot-com billionaires seemingly sprout out in moments and become incredibly wealthy. The problem with it is, is that it almost never happens. And number one, it will make you unhappy to try and build a business with those kind of expectations. And number two, it's just impractical to think like that. All the stats say that almost every great business took time to develop. You must develop a long-term time perspective. And when you look at the research, it shows that a long-term time perspective is absolutely critical to success. A Harvard professor by the name of Edward Banfield did an absolutely fascinating study on why people get rich. His conclusion, long-term time perspective. He said the people who don't make a lot of money have a very short time perspective. The people who build great businesses and invest wisely and build a fortune that way have longer perspective. They don't think about a few months, they think about five years, 10 years, and they really build something big, like a snowball getting bigger and bigger as it goes along. Now, that's not necessarily what you want to hear, that it's going to take a while to build your business. But if you look at the statistics, that's the truth. You can look at all kinds of businesses around the world and you'll see behind them is long-term time perspective. Have a look at the great corporations in Japan. They're famous for having 100-year business plans. Now, how can you possibly know what's gonna go on in a century down the track? You can't, you don't even know what's gonna go on in business two years down the track. But it's the philosophy of long-term thinking that they're more concerned about, about saying, okay, how can we build not just a company that's good next week, next month, next year, but next century? Extraordinarily unusual thinking, but it's built some of the best corporations in Japan. Have a look at Marriott. Marriott is one of the largest hotel chains in the world today. How did it start? Not even with a single hotel. It started with a single root beer stand that one of the Marriott boys started. And eventually it went from there. Sure, it took time, but now it's one of the mightiest uh, accommodation chains on the globe. We talk about Starbucks, an incredible company, 16,000 stores. But here's an amazing fact. For the first five years, Starbucks only had 13 stores. So they built the foundation first and then made it happen. Merck, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. It's worth $41 billion now. But when it started, it was just a single pharmacy, just a single drugstore. Good things take time. Or have a look at Nike. People talk about, wow, what an extraordinary phenomenon. Phil Knight's a billionaire. It took years and years and years before Nike even broke the $1 million barrier in revenue. Or have a look at Walmart. Walmart, for seven years, they only had two stores. Now, they're, by some measures, the largest corporation in the world. But it started off slowly. So if your business isn't going as fast as you want, don't get frustrated. Don't, don't be fooled by these magazine articles about these companies that become huge in a moment. You may well be on the right track. So keep persisting, keep adapting your strategy, and keep having a long-term time perspective. A key attribute in having a long-term time perspective is to see hardships as normal. If you don't do that, if you see hardships as something that's bad, like a sign that your company's going badly, then you're likely gonna give up very soon. 
But really, when you look at the history of the greatest companies and you read the biographies of the greatest CEOs, you'll see that hardship was a constant. Failure was a constant. There's a lot of talk at the moment about how great Apple is. And uh, recently, they introduced the iPad. Now, the iPad is surely a phenomenal product launch and an extraordinary product. But people think they only came up with it in the last year or two. Apple have been working on tablet computers, a version of the iPad, for at least 12 years. And I remember over 15, 20 years ago, buying a Newton from Apple, which was an incredible failure as a product, but basically was a forerunner of the iPad that they introduced. Now, the iPad comes out and people say, what a masterpiece and what an extraordinary product launch. Do you know that the iPad sold more product than any other launch in history, $150 million worth of product in 24 hours. But it wasn't an overnight success story, was it? For at least 12 years, they've been working on the forerunner to the iPad. I think in life, and certainly in business, you need what I call urgent patience. Day to day, you've got to behave urgently. And a guy by the name of uh, John Cotter, uh, excellent professor at Harvard, did an entire book called A Sense of Urgency. And he showed that one of the fundamental characteristics of a great company was day-to-day -day urgency. But day-to-day -day urgency isn't enough. You have to balance that with long-term time perspective. And if you balance urgency with long-term thinking, then you're going to build an awesome company. The next characteristic of all great entrepreneurs is optimism. Now, optimism gets a pretty bad rap among some people. People say, oh, optimists, they're just dreamers. They don't live in the real world. But you know, when you look at the great entrepreneurs, they're all optimists. Optimism helps in business in three fundamental ways. First of all, you have to be optimistic in order to be daring. I mean, the great entrepreneurs are always daring. They're trying new things. They're leaping into new fields. If you're not optimistic, you're never gonna have the courage to do that. Four out of five businesses supposedly fail in the first five years, and out of the one that survives, four out of five of them fail in the next five years. So really, to even start a business demands tremendous optimism. Then optimism helps your persistence. Persistence is absolutely vital to being a great entrepreneur. And optimism helps you perform well. That's just not me saying that, but there's a lot of research on it. For instance, one of the kings of research on optimistic thinking is a guy by the name of Martin Seligman from the University of Pennsylvania. Now, Seligman did a very interesting research study in 1985. He looked at executives from the MetLife Insurance Company. And what he found was that those that tested as being most optimistic sold 31% more insurance policies than those that were pessimistic. So really, when it comes down to cold, hard dollars and cents, we perform better when we're optimistic. So it's vital. And you look at anyone in history, anyone who's achieved greatness, and you'll find optimism was one of their core character traits. Have a look at Rupert Murdoch, arguably the greatest media entrepreneur of the last century. Now, Murdoch started by inheriting a small newspaper in Adelaide in Australia. Murdoch then flew over to London and bought one of the biggest papers in London. Now, this is 30 or 40 years ago. This is a time when very few people went overseas to do business. And here's this small Australian entrepreneur going over and buying one of the biggest, most successful Sunday papers in England. That took tremendous optimism for him to even think that he could pull it off. But he didn't stop there, of course. He then went to America and then opened the fourth television network. Now, the prevalent view at that time was there are three networks and there always will be three networks. There is no room for a fourth. Well, Murdoch said that's absolute rubbish and he proved them all wrong. They are now one of the great television organizations of the world. But he didn't stop there. He then paid around 580 million for a little company called MySpace. And people said, what are you paying this fortune for, for this strange internet company? But within two years, it was valued at several billion dollars. Yes, he's daring, but he's optimistic to even think that these dares will come off. It's absolutely critical to Rupert Murdoch's mental state. Look at Walt Disney. Here's a guy who started off 
with animations, just doing cartoons of characters like Snow White. And then he said, I'm going to create the world's first theme park. Now, back then, he set it up in Anaheim, which was just a series of orange groves in the middle of nowhere, out in the country. And he built this extraordinary thing, and everyone said he was going to fail. And he, had, he came close to bankruptcy so many times. And yet, through sheer force of will and sheer optimism, he prevailed, and the Disney empire was born. Optimism was vital to Disney. After the great financial crisis, we saw the three largest automobile companies all come close to bankruptcy. In fact, several had massive multi-billion dollar bailouts from the government. But one company didn't, and that was Ford. So let's have a look at the chief executive of Ford at the time, Alan Mulally. Prior to joining Ford, he was running Boeing and doing an extraordinary job. So one day, Mulally gets his phone call, and they say, hey, why don't you come over to Ford? What is this company? It's a company that is in danger of being bankrupt, has been going badly for years. Some say it can't be rescued, is going down the tube. Only an optimist would have taken that job, but Mullaly did. And not only did he not get a bailout from the government because he didn't need it, but within years had a billion dollar profit. Extraordinary performance, incredible turnaround, and it demanded extraordinary optimism. Optimism is so important, but how do you develop it? Well, number one, you need to focus on it. Just focusing each morning, getting up in the morning and saying, I am going to be optimistic, will work. It's a simple technique, but it will work. And it'll work because of a concept called the Hawthorne effect. Many years ago, a researcher by the name of Hawthorne found an extraordinary thing. He was asked to go in and study the productivity at a factory. But the moment the workers knew they were being observed, their performance went up. So he actually didn't have to do anything. Just the mere fact they focused on productivity made them more productive. And so it is with optimism. If you just focus on it, the Hawthorne effect shows you will become more optimistic. The next thing you can do to be optimistic is to train yourself to look for the good. You know, there's almost nothing that can happen in our lives that doesn't have a good side. You know, if you experience hardship, you get stronger, you get wisdom. But so many of us don't recognize that. But you can train yourself to look for the good. Let me give you a classic example of someone who did. One of the most successful businessmen in insurance history is a guy by the name of W. Clement Stone. And Stone was an incredible optimist, and it helped build an $800 million fortune for him. Every time something uh, bad happened to the company, he had trained himself to say, that's good. Literally, they'd say, hey, our sales are down 30%. He'd say, that's good. And then he'd look for ways that it was good. Or they'd say, hey, your wife just left you. He'd say, that's good. And he'd try and think of a reason why that was good. I mean, it was a bizarre way to live, but he was able to build an absolutely extraordinary company by training himself to look for the good. Train yourself to look for the good, and you can experience similar business excellence. The next way you'd be an optimist is you uplift your staff. You see, it's all very well you being optimistic, but unless you concentrate on the people around you, then you're not going to be performing at an optimum level. You know, the great management guru, Ken Blanchard, uh, author of uh, many, many great books on uh, management, including the original One Minute Manager, had a great technique for increasing optimism inside companies. He said, instead of walking around trying to find your staff doing something wrong, catch them doing something right their self-esteem will go up, they'll feel better, they'll do a better job. I think it works. You know, the stats show that the number one reason that someone stays in a company is not money, it's appreciation. And if you can train yourself to look for the good in your staff and be optimistic about your staff, you're gonna build an incredible team. The next way to be optimistic is to focus on things that you can change. Whenever something bad happens, there are things we can change and things we really can't do much about. And one of the great techniques is to create what I call the two circles of influence. And with this, you literally, if you've got a problem, in one circle, you put all the things that are under your control. And in another circle, you put all the things that aren't under your control. Then you put those out of your mind and you focus only on what you can control. And this is a characteristic, not only of optimistic people, but of all great performers in any field. A couple of Olympics ago, I was so impressed with one of Australia's great swimmers, 
Ian Thorpe, when he lost a race, he came second in this race that everybody expected him to win. And he was interviewed as soon as he came out of the pool. And I was so impressed by his focus on what he could change and what he couldn't change. At the time, the interviewer commiserated with him and he said, sure, I wish I'd won, but I did this, I did this, I did this. I was very, very happy with these aspects of my swimming. So here's a real champion. He's a man that's experiencing hardship, but is just focusing on what he can control in order to maximize his performance. And that's a crucial aspect of optimism. Optimism is so important to leadership and excellence in business or in any other field. As the great General Colin Powell said, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. The next characteristic of all great entrepreneurs is improvement orientation. Great entrepreneurs are always trying to get better, make things better, make things work better, make more money out of them, just slowly but surely improve. Let me give a classic example of this. After World War II, Japan was absolutely obliterated and the Allied powers got together and tried to create a group of people who could help Japan get back on its feet. One of them was a man by the name of William Edwards Deming and he created two key concepts that really transformed modern industrial Japan. The first was the emphasis on quality. He said instead of just making stuff, try and make it as best you can and he instituted a whole lot of systems for doing that. The second concept that Deming worked on was the concept of continuous improvement as it became known in Japan Keizen and that is that if you just improve a little bit every day soon you will have great manufacturing, soon you will have a great corporation, soon you will have great profits just little by little, inch by inch and that philosophy transformed modern industrial Japan. It made a huge difference to their total output and the quality of their output. You see, greatness is not about perfection. It's about correction. It's about doing the little things again and again until you finally get better. And I find that completely exciting because I realize that I don't have to be smarter than everybody else or uh, have more contacts than everybody else or be special in any other way except that I have to learn better and keep improving and keep getting better and better and better. And if I do that, I'll overcome the more intelligent business people. I'll overcome the people with better capital and better contacts. Learning the continuous improvement that is emphasized in KZN, once it becomes part of your life, can really make you absolutely unstoppable. Have a look at the Porsche Carrera, one of the world's most famous automobiles. Why is it so great? How come every two or three years when they introduce a new Porsche do people say, this is absolutely extraordinary? It's because they've been rebuilding that car, they've been finessing that Carrera for over 40 years. You can literally get a photograph of the first one and have a look at the one this year and they look pretty similar. It's KZN, it's endless, tiny improvements. And what's the result? This particular model of Porsche is seen as one of the greatest cars in the history of mankind. The power of KZN, the power of continuous improvement. I was in at Whole Foods, which is a supermarket that specializes in healthy foods, uh, a while back, and I saw a really interesting thing. I saw this suggestion wall, and up on this wall, all their customers had given them suggestions about how they could improve their business. But what made it different from your typical suggestion box that you see around the place in, in some companies is that underneath every suggestion, Whole Foods had written the answer. So if someone complained, they told them what they were going to do about it. Or if someone had an idea, they said, okay, we've looked into it and we're going to do X. Now, not only does it make the customer feel terrific, like they're being listened to, but you could see that the spirit of Kaizen, the spirit of improvement, continuous improvement orientation, is alive and well at Whole Foods and has helped make it one of the great companies in America today. One of the kings of personal and professional development in the world today is a man by the name of Brian Tracy and he's written over 54 books on uh, personal and professional improvement and has some tremendous concepts about how we can improve ourselves. And he has a wonderful formula that I'd like to share with you now that I think is absolutely magnificent. And it's, it's called Tracy's Continuous Improvement Formula. And what he says is this. He said, you might be good at your job. 
your company might be doing well, but I'll bet you can improve at least half a percent a week. Well, of course you can. Everybody can improve half a percent a week, can't they? But he said, if you do this, think about it. Think what happens. If you can improve half a percent a week, that's an improvement of 2% a month. That's an improvement of 24% a year. If you continue at that rate and you add the compounding of those numbers, you have doubled your performance every 2.7 years. Every 2.7 years, you're twice as good as you were. You can earn twice as much every 2.7 years if you only improve your earning capacity 10% a week. Not only that, but over a decade, it'll be a 1,004% improvement. And that is absolutely massive. That is over 10 times the improvement. And that's assuming you are pretty good to start off with. That's the power of KZEN. That's the continuous improvement formula. And it works. Number five, great entrepreneurs are hard working. Now, does that sound too obvious that I suggest that you need to work harder? Well, maybe you don't. But maybe you do, because in this world of ours where we're all about the quick fix, we're all about getting something for nothing, we've got to be very, very careful when it comes to our own business that we don't forget the very fundamental idea that we need to work harder than our competition. Now, I know that's not particularly pleasant to contemplate working harder, but you look at the great entrepreneurs and you see that hard work is fundamental to their ethic and to their philosophy of life. They worked hard and they got the results of working hard. Nothing special about it, nothing glamorous, but it makes a difference. Do you know the average millionaire in America works 59 hours a week? 59 hours a week, how much are you working? Maybe that's the area that you need to change to improve your results. Now, can you do less? Of course you can do less. And you can even make money doing less. And we'll teach you a whole lot of productivity and time management principles to pull it down from that 59 hours. But the truth is, you can't do much less. You can't do it in just a few hours a week. You've got to commit to hard work. And you look at any great entrepreneur and you'll see hard work was instrumental in their success. I remember reading about Bill Gates when he first started. And he would work at his desk till late at night, fall asleep at his desk, wake up and just continue working. I mean, what a work ethic, absolutely extraordinary. Look at the great CEOs of the world. Uh, take Disney, for example, Robert Iger, the CEO of Disney, up at five to start work, in by seven, having already been to the gym. Getting up at five, getting in at seven, this is not unusual in the world of top CEOs. Many of them are doing it. Now, do you have to do it? No, absolutely not. You can get in a reasonable hour. But don't complain if you don't reach the highest levels of success. Hard work is absolutely crucial. Look at Michael Milken, the infamous junk bond king who is a billionaire now on the Forbes 400 list. When he first started out, there's a very famous story that he didn't have much money and he took the bus to work each day. But he was there so early taking the bus at 4 a.m. or whatever that he had a miner's helmet turned on with the lamp turned on so that he could read his notes in pitch darkness as he was driving off to work. Fanaticism? Maybe. But that's what it takes to be the best. Scarly McCabe Sloves was an incredible advertising agency and when I first started out in advertising, I wanted to be like them. And then I read an article about how they started out in New York City. And how they started out was they worked till midnight and then they went under their desks and there were sleeping bags. And they went to sleep and then got up in the morning and kept working. Now this is fanaticism, I know you don't have to do this, but all I'm emphasizing is hard work is crucial to being a success. So if you wanna have a look at what you're doing and if you're not happy with where you're going and the results you're getting, increase the number of hours you work. Now there's a saying that you don't have to work hard, you gotta work smart. I agree that you gotta work smart, but you also have to work hard to be a great entrepreneur. Number six. Great entrepreneurs are resilient. They keep powering. They expect crises, but they just power on through them. They push themselves to go past what's hard, what's difficult, what's an obstacle, what's a wall, and they break through it and win. 
Now that is contrary to your typical businessman who gives up. You know, you've got to push yourself. As Mario Andretti, the great uh, racing car driver said, he said, if everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. Expect chaos, expect crises. It's all part of pushing hard in a business. It's all part of getting extraordinary growth. You're gonna to have to take that sense of chaos and keep pursuing it, keep being resilient. Have a look at a few examples of, of titans of business and see behind the successes, the failures, and the enormous resilience that they have. Michael Bloomberg, a billionaire and currently mayor of New York. Well, how did he start out? Well, in his 40s, he was sacked by Salomon Brothers. Now, a lot of people would be licking their wounds and they just take any old job. But Michael Bloomberg thought differently to the average person who's lost their job. He thought to himself, instead of just looking for a job, I'm gonna create a new company. And he came up with this idea, which at the time was called the Bloomberg machine. And what it was, was a brilliant device that allowed fund managers and financial analysts to get all the data they needed on their desk whenever they wanted it. Not only did he go off and do this after being sacked, he managed to convince a company to give him $30 million to build the company and eventually became a multi-billionaire and one of the richest men in the world as a result of him being resilient enough to not give up after he'd been sacked. I read a very interesting interview with one of the heads of Shell, the oil company. And the interviewer was saying, well, you guys have got a reputation for striking a lot of oil. What's your secret? Do you have some special technology? Do you have some geniuses that are actually looking for oil? How are you actually doing it? And the CEO of Shell smiled and he said, it's nothing to do with that. The reason that we've struck more oil than everybody else is simple. We dig more holes. That's it. That's the resilience. That's the persistence. That's the keeping on that Shell was doing to get the different results. It wasn't fancy, but that resilience is absolutely imperative if you want to be a great entrepreneur. In my own really small example, I started my company in about 2000 to be an online advertising agency. The company was called Photon Group. And that seemed like a good idea at the time to build that company and a series of companies around online advertising. And for a while, things went well. Then all of a sudden, the dot-com crash happened. And none of our clients had any money. And no businesses wanted to do online advertising. And it was a complete and utter disaster. Now, we could have given up at that point. Things were pretty bad. But we were resilient. And we kept going. And we adjusted and rebuilt our company around offline advertising. So we said, OK, we're not going to make any money with internet advertising. What else can we do? We can do newspaper. We can do TV. We can do direct mail. And slowly but surely, we built the company up. Fast forward 10 years later, and the company is now the 15th largest advertising and marketing communications group in the world with over 50 companies in 14 countries employing over 6,000 full and part-time staff. But you know what? If we hadn't have been resilient, if we hadn't have persisted, well, the company would have stopped in about 2001. Resilience really works. One of my heroes is a guy called General Petraeus. You've probably heard of him. He's the guy who turned the Iraq war around. Now, when he took charge of the Iraq war, the Americans were losing around 53 people a day, 53 deaths a day. Imagine running that corporation. Extraordinary. And yet through sheer resilience, things didn't go well at first. Sheer resilience and doggedness, he was able to change strategies and bit by bit, turn the army's systems of operation around and dramatically increase it to the point where when he left, there are only four people a day dying. Now that's huge anyway, but look at how he improved things. What an extraordinary general Petraeus is. The key to it, resilience. Zen philosophers have a, a great analogy for this kind of resilience. And they say that you should have a mind like water. So what do they mean by that? Well, when you look at a lake, it's all very peaceful. And then you can throw a stone into that lake. And what happens? Well, the water immediately reacts and the ripples go out. But as soon as the stone has gone to the bottom, it's all calm again. So the Zen philosophers say, how soon can you get back to calm once a stone is thrown into your lake? the lake of your mind. You need a mind like water. Water is fantastically adaptable and immediately goes back to calm after it's been interrupted. That's resilience at its best. 
That's flexibility at its best. And it's vital that you develop this resilient character if you want to be a great entrepreneur. And finally, number seven, don't make money your primary aim. The best entrepreneurs don't. Now that seems paradoxical because you'd think the business is all about making money and I guess it is. But when you look at the great entrepreneurs, they don't necessarily concentrate on the money aspect as much as the building aspect. There's a very interesting book that came out recently called Obliquity. And the subhead is why goals are best achieved indirectly. And it's by a renowned British economist. And what he shows is in business, in science, in many areas of life, we achieve our goals indirectly. And I think that's very relevant for entrepreneurs because when you look at the best entrepreneurs, they're not necessarily just focused on money. They're focused on something bigger. When Bill Gates got up in the morning, when he was building Microsoft, was he saying, I want to be the richest man in the world? Absolutely not. He was on fire with passion about the power of software to transform the world. What about Google? Were the Google guys just obsessed with becoming billionaires? No, they were obsessed with getting the world's information and putting it in a form that any one of us could access. These are bigger dreams than making money. And all the research indicates if you're just after money as your primary aim, then you're unlikely, paradoxically, to make the most money. So think about what you can do in your business life that isn't about money. What can you build? What can you stand for? What kind of great corporation can you create? And when you think that way, it makes a huge difference. Look at Sam Walton. Here's a guy who built arguably the biggest company in the world. But even when he was a multi-billionaire, he was still driving his old pickup truck to work. Money didn't interest him. What interested him was creating a fantastic retail organization. So be careful obsessing about money. It may not be the fastest route to getting rich. It's a strange paradox, but true. An interesting case study is Boeing. When Boeing built the 747, it completely transformed the company. But how did they build it? Well, the aeronautics engineers inside Boeing were absolutely devoted to creating the ultimate passenger aircraft. And as a result of that devotion, not an obsession with money, as a result of that devotion, they created an incredibly healthy company. Then, in about 1998, Boeing's values at the top amongst the CEO and the board changed. And they said, we're all about increasing shareholder return. Soon after, the company started performing much more poorly. So why is that? It's because they were no longer about creating a great product. They're just about the cash. Are you just about the cash? Is that what is actually stopping you from creating an extraordinary organization? It makes a huge difference. Now, I'm not saying that money isn't important. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a goal. Just don't build your whole company around money because if you do, you won't create a great company. Okay, so they are the seven characteristics of how great entrepreneurs think. Let's briefly summarize them. Number one, great entrepreneurs are contrarian. They've got the guts to think differently and to do that each and every day. Number two, great entrepreneurs have long-term time perspective. They're not just about making money this month, they're about building a real company. Number three, great entrepreneurs are optimistic. It's crucial to be optimistic if you're running a business because it's hard, you're gonna get a lot of problems. Unless you maintain optimism inside yourself and with your staff, you won't be able to overcome them. Number four, improvement orientation. Great entrepreneurs are always trying to fix things, just a little, just a bit, inch by inch, until finally they've created an extraordinary organization. Number five, great entrepreneurs are hardworking. It's not glamorous, but it's true. You've got to work harder than your competition if you want to beat them. Number six, great entrepreneurs are resilient. They are unstoppable. They keep on going. They keep on persisting until they win. And finally, great entrepreneurs don't put money first. They put building an extraordinary organization first, achieving something magnificent first, not just getting the cash. So now we come to the homework, the work that I'm gonna ask you to do each and every week to really move your company forward. Now, it's never going to be much. I've deliberately kept it very, very simple and easy to do, but it is so vital 
that you do it. If you just listen to these lectures and don't act on them, you're not going to get extraordinary results. You've got to do the action steps as well. So number one, very easy. First mission is get a workbook. Just get a simple book that you can write all your lessons in and all your notes about each of the lectures in so that in one place you've got all the information about your business education. That's a small thing, but it'll stop you having pieces of paper everywhere and losing track of stuff. It's very important. Number two, I want you to have a look at this list of the seven characteristics of great entrepreneurs, and I want you to rank yourself between one and 10 in each of the seven areas. How do you score? It's only when you get clear about the areas that you're deficient in that you can get better at them. And finally, step three, take one area that you've scored lowest in and come up with three solutions for how you can be better in that area. So let's say that your lowest score is optimism. You might design a system in the morning when you get up that you start thinking for just a few minutes about all the good things that are happening in your life and in your business, and you make sure that you do it every day. That could be one thing. Number two, you might develop a system for walking around and trying to uplift your staff etc, etc. It's easy to come up with three solutions to any one of these seven areas, but you must do it. And then when you get the things you're weakest on, you slowly but surely make them better. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the first lesson at the Fortune Institute. And I want to thank you for your time. I really value it. I want to emphasize that you must do the homework to make this work. And I want to tell you that next week we have an extraordinary lesson that's entirely focused on how you can increase your profits incredibly quickly. Until then, work hard, think big, and I'll see you next week at the Fortune Institute.